Thanks for tuning in. My name is Elise McMahon, and I am going to talk about an adaptation of Mapper to exploratory machine learning. I think this is a really uh, cool variation and inspiring for many possibilities of applications and variations on Mapper. So I'll begin with a brief description of Mapper uh, before moving on to the variation. And there is some links to some more descriptive videos um, if you want some more background on the algorithm. So Mapper is an algorithm that produces a graph. And more precisely, this is a simplicial set. Um, and from this is uh, obtained from a data set via a function that captures special features of the data. And those special features of the data are um, based on the user's choice. So the first step is to apply a chosen function to the data. And this is referred to as the filter function. This is meant to pick out special features of the data. Um, so we might imagine that our data points are points on this orange blob. And in this picture, our filter function is just measuring the height of each point. Um, but this is not restricted to something like the height. It could would usually be something that reflects the data. So it might be a probability function or a heat map or density, et cetera. And uh, it's really not that limited, except that usually the codomain, which we see here, is R or R2. So the next step is to choose a cover of the image of F and consider its pre-image. So here we have chosen to just take intervals of this image, this red, orange, and yellow, and blue, and we pull them back to the, the domain and consider the, their pre-image. Um, so uh, we also have to make sure that we choose the intervals to be overlapping because we'll want them um, in, in the next step to, to overlap a little. So throughout, even though you can't see that that's overlapping, we're sort of imagining them to, to overlap between colors. Um, and this is where we see why we have the, the restriction on the codomain being usually R or R2. Uh, essentially, if the codomain is Rn for large n, a traditional like hypercube cover, so where we take intervals like this in each dimension, and then their product uh, would give a really large number of elements if we if we also want to do a separation on each dimension of more than like two or three uh, intervals. So if I wanted to say split my image in just 10 pieces, so all the real numbers is where I'm mapping to and I split it into just 10 pieces, but my codomain is 10 dimensional, then all of a sudden I'm gonna have 10 to the 10th sets, which is, an insane amount to work with. Um, so that's where that restriction of mapper kind of comes in, but there's there's lots of ways around it. You could use a dimension reduction, um, although that does have the setback that now you're not really working with the actual image of your function, or you could think of different covers, which is what we'll see. Uh, so the uh, last step is to take the nerve of the pre-image of the cover. And if you don't know what the nerve is, it's just the simple step of taking for each node, um, we'll define a node for each cluster of elements in the pre-image. So if this, if we're looking at this red blob on the right, it's kind of all in one cluster, so it gives one node. And then this other red blob gives the other red node. And then this orange blob, because it's all a kind of one piece, it gives a single node. And then because we have these overlaps, we get edges. But note that we won't, we don't have overlaps between any of the same colors. So we don't have any edges connecting the same colors. Okay, so this leads us to a question, the question, main question that I want to address. Um, and that's how can we adapt Mapper to more general functions, such as a machine learning algorithm where the codomain is very large and the standard interval cover is not very meaningful. 
Uh, one approach is work by Nathaniel Saul and Dustin Arden. They develop an application of Mapper to a machine learning image classifier to better understand the algorithm. I will also include a link to their work in the video description and everything that I talk about now is due to them. Okay, so when they um, describe this adaptation, they run it on an example. So I'm gonna go through and explain this example and the image data that they use is um, leaf data. So each data point is a image of a leaf and there are 14 engineered features such as lobeness, elongation, smoothness uh, associated to each leaf. So they'll have a certain number um, saying how smooth they are, for example. And there's 30 different leaf types. And they're, throughout this, the colors here refer to which leaf type. So if you see red, we're thinking of it, the hackberry, for example. And then the filter function is an image classifying machine learning algorithm that assigns to each unknown leaf image a probability that it is a certain type of leaf. So in this picture here, we have just some unknown leaf and the algorithm is assigning a probability to each of the leaf types. So now we see that the codomain of our function is um, 30 dimensional. It's gonna be the interval of zero to one to the 30th. Um, but if we're breaking up uh, interval, like if we're gonna put a cover on it, right? We would kind of maybe want to like split it at least into 10, like 10% uh, is a big difference in, in probability. So, you know, at, automatically if we use the standard interval cover, we're gonna end up with a really huge number of sets in our cover. Um, we could again also use a dimension reduction, but there is the uh, setback that then we're not working with the actual image of the function. So that led uh, them to come up with this new cover, which is determined by the number of types that we're predicting and two parameters of our choosing. There's a threshold value for statistical significance. So we're not gonna consider all the probabilities. We'll just take the ones that are statistically significant and the number of top rankings that we want to consider. So again, we're not gonna care if a leaf is ranked the top 28th, this 28th prediction, if we, if we were to rank them as in their likelihood, um, probably. So we'll also have that parameter to reduce the number of uh, Date, the amount of data basically. Um, so each, op uh, so we have, we'll have one open set for each of these and they are like, if I have a type A and a prediction ranking I, the set would be defined by as, it'd be denoted by UAI and it would contain all of the statistically significant data points that are the most, I, the I most likely to be type A. So, by statistically significant, we mean that its probability is above that threshold value that we chose. And for example, if I was taking you uh, Birch I or Birch one, I would be just taking all of the statistically significant data points that are the most likely to be Birch. Okay, so in this leaf example, uh, let's consider let's consider an example where we have um, we're just considering the top two predictions. Then the sets would be U Birch one, U Birch two, U Beacon via one, U Beacon via two, et cetera. So we could go through the list of these and having a one and a two for each of them. And if we wanted to say that we had to be greater than 0.4 for statistical significance, um, then, and suppose we had this as our sample data, uh, I've circled the data points here that are statistically significant. So we see that leaf A, and assuming that I don't have anything else significant going on uh, after this um, first seven types, uh, leaf A's only uh, prediction that's statistically significant is chestnut. And then leaf B has, has three. So, we would have that leaf A is in one chestnut and it's not in any other sets. And we'd have leaf B is in U1 birch because that's the top prediction. And it's in U2 cork oak because we see it's the second prediction and it's not in anything corresponding to linden because we're only taking the top two predictions. 
Okay, so that's how that works. And then we uh, can obtain the graph from the cover uh, by taking the nerve essentially. And so here we're defining a node for each UAI and an edge between them if they intersect non-trivially. Now each node represents a set of leaves that the algorithm sees as similar. However, they might not actually all be the same leaf. Only with the perfect classification would this happen. Uh, so it gives a very interesting graph because if it, if it was perfect, you would just have that uh, each node had, the, if it was say a, um, oh, I should describe the coloring. The, the nodes here are colored uh, by the most common leaf in that set. So for example, this orange uh, node is colored that because the most, uh, most of the leaves in it where birch we see, because birch here is colored orange. So uh, it might just only have birch, but it also might have other leaves in it. And this kind of uh, edges then are representing a leaf that was classified as both types. And so the this kind of loosely represents a relationship between types. Um, and so it gives a really interesting graph and it allows one to study the algorithm and how the algorithm treated the leaves. And you can look at particular instances, but without having to have knowledge of, of the algorithm because it's you know very complicated. So you can obtain um, some understanding and uh, information from the algorithm via this way. Um, you could study patterns, relations, et cetera. Uh, thank you.